morning, everyone. Welcome. Happy to see uh, this is going to be a conversation huh? revolving around uh, our academy camp with four in Timisoara, uh, which was uh, about community development through creative action. It was the um, fourth uh, academy camp that we held uh, on site and also hybrid with uh, the lead trainer, Francois Matarasso, who's here with us today to have this conversation with our friend uh, and uh, leader for this fifth academy camp, Jordi Pascual. So without further ado, let's uh, go. Uh, Jordi, thank you so, so much again for uh, uh, having uh, taken up the role of uh, moderating this conversation. I think that, um, you know, everybody will agree with me that the feeling from yesterday is extremely positive, uh, that uh, the conversations were interesting, relevant, and gave us all food for thought. I actually um, uh, took a screenshot yesterday afternoon of a comment from the team of Braga 27, because I was very touched by that comment. Uh, they said, thank you so much for these sessions. Uh, one of these sessions is so much more worth than reading a hundred bit books, something like that. <laughs> so I thought it was really very nice. Uh, thank you, Braga, for that comment. But I do think that it conveys the feeling that we all had yesterday on during, uh, during the day. So thank you again, Jordi, Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mercedes. Muchísimas gracias. I have to say that today's keynote speaker, Francois Matarazzo, is one of the persons that has influenced more my career. Uh, I admire what he's done. I admire what he's doing. So I am delighted to share a conversation with him. Francois has worked in community arts since 1981 as an artist, as a researcher, as a teacher, policymaker, and writer. His report, published in 1997, Use or Ornament, established very influential concepts in cultural policy. Between 2018 and 2015, he produced a series of books on undervalued areas of cultural life. Under those books uh, were published under the collective title, Regular Marvels. And his last book, the book published, he published in 2019, A Restless Art, How Participation Won and Why It Matters, is also uh, extremely interesting for all those that support cultural policies from different uh, angles. He's worked in more than uh, 40 countries, held honorary professorships in the UK and Australia, and he uh, is the, the leader of a website, Parliament of Dreams. Francois, uh, I am saying in public uh, things that you, you know, a pleasure to have uh, you in this uh, fifth academic camp in the third session and to talk with you on community development through creative action. Uh, my first question will be very, very basic, but uh, I think it is, it is important to, to set the, the foundations and to, to be pedagogical with, yeah, with this question. What is participatory art? Thank you, Jordi. It's a good question, and because it opens up really the, the whole question of the changing relationship between professional artists, producers, and societies. And if you will allow me just to go back a moment, the reason, the, the subtitle of the book you mentioned, A Restless Art, the subtitle was <clears throat> How Participation Won and why it matters. And it was a slightly cheeky uh, uh, statement, but it came out of the, I mean, as you, you said, I began working in this field more than 40 years ago. At the time, 
people who worked in what we then called community arts, and I still do, were seen by most people in the arts world as being um, disreputable. Uh, if we were doing this work, we were either politically radical or social workers or just not very good artists. Um, and so the, if you like, the earlier part of my working life was, was really part of a, of a struggle for what the place of art in society was and who was entitled to define what art was for and what, what its standards of quality were. In the, in the period really in the last two decades since the turn of the millennium, I would say that participatory art has become very fashionable and it's become fashionable under many different names. Um, sometimes it, it's a spectrum of, of things, but everything from socially engaged practice to um, outreach and education to audience development work. Um, I, I have preferred to use the term participatory art as a big umbrella term for all of these different practices because largely nobody cares about the what socially engaged practice is except the people who are doing it. Uh, the people who who they who might be involved in that, uh, most of these art world terms I think are incomprehensible and off-putting. So participatory art is I've settled on as a generic term. And for me, it means something very simple and straightforward. Um, and it's the definition that I gave in, in the, the book. So I describe participation, participatory art as the creation of art by professional and non-professional artists. And let me just say two, two quick footnotes to that. One is that participatory art means the creation of a work of art. There is lots of time when professional artists work with non-professionals and they're not involved in the creation of art. Lots of audience development work, lots of education work, lots of teaching uh, is, involves that cooperation, but the purpose is not to create a work of art. That purpose matters because if, the purpose is to create a work of art, then the people involved are involved in the same act in the world as uh, professional artists. So that's the first thing. The second footnote is, in thinking this through, I settled uh, in my own mind on the, uh, the phrase professional and non-professional artists rather than what's much more common, which is to talk about artists and communities or artists and ordinary people, or there's a whole range of sometimes euphemisms, I could say, for um, the people that the professional artists want to work with. The reason that I think professional and non-professional artists is, is a, a better explanation is, first of all, because if you are involved in the creation of a work of art, then you are an artist in exactly the same way as if you are involved in a marathon, you're a runner. There may be professional runners who will be trying to break the world record. You might simply try and be trying to finish the marathon, but you're all involved in the same thing. And uh, that is important because it, it recognizes the act of creation as being important, but it does recognize there is a difference between a professional and a non-professional. And that's a difference we could we can talk about, but, but perhaps the most important thing is that they bring professional artists and non-professional artists bring different resources to the act of art making and have different reasons for being involved in it and have different social identities. So that professional, non-professional thing is important. It's the one thing I would say is that it's not about whether you're paid or not. 
um, most poets don't get paid to write poetry. Um, they get paid to do other things. If they had to live on what they earned by writing poetry, they would be very hungry. Um, so that question of, of being paid is, I think, irrelevant. It's much more to do with your relationship with what you're doing uh, and how the, the, your social uh, world recognizes that relationship for you. Your answer is a box with several several questions uh, issues we can develop in the in the in the conversation a turning point in uh say that the, if i may the paradigm of cultural policies uh, you you mentioned 1981 you mentioned turn of the century uh does it correspond to the say at least in the academic or in the the group of people that discuss on cultural policies does it correspond to a change of paradigm between cultural democratization or the democratization of culture and cultural democracy is that is that so it is and it isn't um so just to be clear the policy of cultural democratization um, emerged in the post-war European sphere in the period of reconstruction and the period of the establishment of welfare states in response to the crisis of the Second World War. So uh, welfare states established health services, education services, um, employment services, and Mostly they, not all, but mostly they also established cultural services with the idea that uh, access to culture was part of what um, citizens should have in the same way they should have access to health, access to education. That came under challenge in the late 1960s as so much of the post-war uh, settlement came under challenge and uh, artists and other activists, campaigners, saw this, po this first war, this first post-war policy of cultural democratization as paternalistic because they were saying, they, they, it seemed to be saying, um, it, it, all that matters is that people have access to theater, to dance, to music, um, they don't have any culture of their own. They simply need to be able to, to go and enjoy and admire the, the, the great art that others create. What emerged in the 1960s and 70s took the name cultural democracy. And its argument was that first culture was multidimensional. It was diverse. It was multipolar and that everyone in society was not only able to consume culture, but to produce it, that everyone had an equal voice in that. Those two ideas have continued to, to, to um, be opposed in cultural policy. Uh, and to some extent, I think this is, it's, it's rather unhelpful, um, again, partly because the concepts are not well understood even by many people who work in the cultural sector. They're certainly not understood by most ordinary citizens. Secondly, they actually have much older roots than that. In some of what I've written, I take the roots back to the invention of fine art in the late 18th century as part of the Enlightenment project. And I say that because as soon as you invent fine art, you automatically invent not fine art. You invent, and you have to create a whole bunch of, of concepts like folk art or traditional art or indigenous art or Japanese art or whatever it may be, popular art, commercial art, that are all subordinate to the elite fine art. But already 
in by the, the early 19th century and the emergence of industrial society, um, some working class communities were creating associations to build their own forms of culture and access to culture and education and seeing culture as a form of empowerment. So I just say that because this long view, I think, is important to what's happened during the course of my professional life. And this is I'm on very thin ice and I, I'm I, I'm sure that many people will will find some of what I'm saying uh, completely wrong. But I would argue, I, I believe that fine art the invention of fine art created an extraordinary it was a bit like a an atomic explosion created a shockwave of energy in in the artistic field in europe particularly that has transformed not only art and culture but our lives with it but I think that like an atomic explosion, its half-life has been diminishing. The half-life of that energy has been diminishing and, and the, the fine art world, the elite art world has been losing uh, its, its energy, its value, its power has been diminishing, particularly in the last 50 years, under pressure of democratization, of our increasing prosperity, of our... Um, the rise in education and leisure and consequently the the uh, a change in power relations between those who were largely the producers of art for most of the 250 years since the enlightenment to today when the production of art is far more um it's a far more level playing field and just to finish this thought, I think that is why cultural institutions in the last 20 or 30 years have sought to respond to cultural democracy, to the claim that everyone can make art, that art and culture is diverse and uh, multipolar. They have sought to respond to that because they recognize without necessarily always understanding it, the change in social fabric that we are seeing and they recognize that it presents an existential threat to the dominant elite cultural institutions that were created uh, on the model of 19th century ideas the the difficulty i think and it's one of the reasons why those two concepts of cultural democracy and cultural democratization are not always very helpful is because the rhetoric of cultural institutions today is increasingly the rhetoric of cultural democracy but the practice remains the practice of cultural democratization so they are i think often uh, dressing up activities and uh, ideas and commitments which are in effect a marginally adjusted continuation of their access policies of the last 70 years, but they are presenting them in more popular and radical uh, language and forms. But they are not yet ready, mostly, they are not yet ready to accept the implication of cultural democracy which is a genuine democratic sharing of power about and authority about cultural value, cultural production, and cultural engagement. It was, it was a very, very good explanation. And I share with you, I celebrate you, you, you invite us, yeah, to the archaeology of the concepts and to the to the beginning of the processes that most of us feel they are natural and and well they are not they are not it is it is very good to 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 see when they appeared first uh, uh, who promoted those concepts uh, what impact those concepts have in in power 
in in sharing power in uh, scrutinizing uh, how power is used so i i enjoyed it very much this this long explanation what is the relation what is the difference between community art and participatory art, art francois you 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 defined participatory in the first question and i presume that uh, it is not exactly the same as community art. Can, can you can you briefly explain the difference of these two concepts, and we'll finish with this more conceptual part with with this question. Thanks, Jody. This can this can be shorter. So, for me, participatory art is this big big field in which people can do all sorts of things and have different relations, but in terms of purpose and the, the the balance of power between the professionals and the non-professionals community art as i first understood it and learned about it in the early 1980s and as i still think about it is it stands on article 27 of the universal declaration of human rights which says that everyone has the right to participate in the cultural life of the community. Um, it goes on to say, and to enjoy the arts and some other things, but it's the participate in the life, cultural life of the community that matters to me. If that is true, if we accept that this is a human right, then community art is about trying to ensure that people have access to that right, that they can participate in the cultural life of the community and participate in the cultural life of the community is not limited it means they can participate in any way they choose and they they see otherwise the it has no meaning what follows for community art as for participatory art is that there must be it must be must stand on a basis of equality between the professional and the non-professional artists because they if they are working on a basis of human rights they have an equal right to be participating in the creation of artwork together no one uh, has more say in what is going to be produced except through the democratic negotiation of working together and and deciding what makes sense uh, and one consequence of that is that with community art, you really cannot determine as a professional artist or as a funder or as a commissioner, you cannot determine in advance what is going to be produced to what standard or how, because if you're doing that, you are taking away from the non-professional artists who are not yet involved uh, any right to shape the project so for me the the simplest uh, difference might be that participatory art can be and indeed sometimes is uh, like performing an orchestral score you know you 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 have to follow what's written on the paper in advance by the by the the composer you have some scope to 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 interpret it uh, in your own way, but largely, if you're if you're a choir member and you're going to you agree to sing Handel's Messiah, you can't uh, introduce an aria by Queen in the middle of it. Um, but in community art, you're really involved in improvisation. It's it's like jazz it's improvised music you don't know what it's going to sound like until you find out who's in the room so maybe you're going to have three bass players a drummer and a clarinetist and that's going to be difficult to play Handel's Messiah with that uh, makeup but you will find whatever it is those musicians want to play so I think for me that's the core difference one is is uh, is is a following a score the other is an improvisation and and because it's improvisation for me it's much more rewarding and exciting and empowering thank you francois that was clear um i have 
questions that are related to the to the academic camp that you led in Timisoara in November 2021. I have questions related to how a European capital of culture should uh, support participatory art. But I'm sure that Mercedes, uh, Sylvain, uh, Christina may have uh, questions right now on, on uh, what you have said. I, I saw Christina clapping when you uh, explained the, the appearance of fine arts uh, as a nuclear explosion. So feel free, Mercedes, Christina, Sylvain, do you have a yeah. comment or a question? Yes, no, I was very impressed by the pre pre presentation of, of Francois, and I see so many also connections with what Christina said yesterday. And of course, the ECOC is often um, a tool for testing new practices. So I suppose that's where uh, we could now, what, that's what we could discuss now, how through um, an ECOC here, you can introduce uh, uh, changes in the way uh, you share the power with uh, a, a greater numbers, a greater number of, of stakeholders. It's a very good question, and is the heart of every ECOC uh, project, and that I that I have seen. I have mixed feelings. I sometimes wonder whether the the most creative and productive part of, and here I'm going to be heretical, whether the most creative and productive part of, of the ECOC process is, is the bidding process rather than the delivery process. Because in the bidding process, there is uh, a blank canvas uh, and everyone brings their hope and ideas into that discussion uh, to imagine not just what is a cultural program, but what is what is the place where they live and what could it be and what do they want it to be? And that can be really, really fruitful. Um, of course, once once there's uh, there's a bid book, I think that ECOCs run into some very difficult um, tensions that are inherent in 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 the project um, because they, they need to try to satisfy some very competing desires. There are the desires of the, the political leadership of the place, which may be more focused on economics and social change. There are the desires of the artistic leaders of the place who may Ha feel that their their reference points the are uh, are more the artist their artistic peers in other parts of Europe or indeed in other parts of the world. And there are the desires of local artists who, excuse me, um, the there are the desires of of local artists and and communities who almost inevitably. Um, will feel that uh, what's happening isn't what should be happening because it's not involving them in the way that they want or expect or need. Um, and finally, uh, there are the desires and interests of the people who don't feel connected with it at all for whatever reasons, but who live in, in, in the city. All of those desires are like a, a series of storms that the ECOC ship has to navigate it, its way through. And I, I say this with, with the greatest of respect, I think it's incredibly difficult to, to do that. And the only way that I think it can be done uh, effectively is to keep talking to people and keep listening to people and being honest, trying to be honest in, in the ways that I'm being honest about those conflicting desires now to say we we do have to meet different visions and we will try to find ways of of meeting some of 
of those visions as far as as possible but it is it is a a, a catalytic moment the echoch uh, uh, and one of the, the understanding that it is a it is catalytic in the sense that it's a it brings the possibilities of change is is the more important thing but that's a much harder thing to to get people to see because what they'll see is what's in the program or what new structures have been created to uh, around the the bid or whatever so yeah i it's <laughs> i can only say i would never run uh, not that anybody would ever ask me to run an echo <laughs> <laughs> if they did, I would never, never say yes. But for Francois, I have a follow-up question, if I may. Mm. Uh, it's how you can connect participatory um, approaches with also the need to have um, a, a European dimension. Because I see not really a, a contradiction, but a, a huge difficulty in doing that. It it is, and I think, um, okay, there there are there are a number of, of, of things. Before I before I give my my one answer, um, I'll just um, say hello to Ed uh, uh, Carroll in in Kaunas, um, who's an old friend, and um, it's it's they. I'm going to go and see. Uh, the, the community opera that this community in Kaunas has been working on uh, in, in a neighborhood called uh, Sunshine. We've been working on this community opera for four years. And interestingly, um, I'm not going to go and see it in Kaunas. I'm going to, to see it in Esch in Luxembourg because for reasons I can't imagine, um, they've been invited to perform the community opera uh, hundreds of kilometers away from the city, although both are capitals of culture. So there are paradoxes in this community engagement. For me, I th I think the and this is this partly brings us back to what I was talking about in Timishwara. Um, there are two ways of engaging um, uh, uh, communities and participation in ECOP programs. And to some extent, they correspond to participatory art and community art, or to, to democratization of culture and cultural democracy. The first way which most European capitals of culture do and, and do more or less well is around access and involving local people in the, the, the high profile program. The second way is to create a, a program which is genuinely community owned and community uh, organized and interested. And I almost think it is it needs to be that because it needs to have its own logic, its own budgets, its own organization. Now, paradoxically, what I think you 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 find uh, can often happen, and I think this happened in the capital of culture in the Netherlands uh, a few years ago. In, they did this very well, and they discovered, of course, that um, uh, the community organized events are actually capable of being the most interesting to outsiders. I once, many years ago, came across an Australian uh, definition of cultural tourism which I really liked. And it said, cultural tourism is the art of participating in someone else's culture. And actually what the community events can do is precisely to give people a more authentic uh, experience. So yes, you can go to, to Timisoara and, and see um, a great opera, but you can see a great opera anywhere. But you can also go to Timisoara and see something in a neighborhood that gives you a sense of actually I've been in Romania, I've been in Timisoara, I've been in a in a uh, a small neighborhood that I would never otherwise set foot in. Uh, so I I think the practical answer is to try to 
to to do both of those programs alongside each other but understand them as being distinct and separate uh, and needing their own principles and values and budgets and ways of organizing. Also, I, I would like you to develop a little bit, uh, if possible, on, on something that you referred to uh, at the very beginning, the, the idea of authority. Uh, you mentioned authority. And um, I think that, um, it, I don't know, I was reading an article yesterday evening and, and, and and, and you've made me think of this now this morning. The article argues um, that in the society in which we live, we are eroding this idea of authority, huh? which, which uh, means uh, also taking responsibility for and relates it to, um, and, and, and sorry, and, and in relation in particular to that double approach to the idea of freedom or liberty, uh, positive and negative. Uh, one being the negative, uh, you cannot impede me, prevent me from doing this, this or that. And the positive idea of liberty or freedom as expressed by Berlin, you know, the, the fact that I can act. Um, could you please, you know, tell us a little bit more about that? That's a really big and important question. I think, I don't believe that we are eroding authority. I think that there are times in human history when authority is more stable and times when it is less stable. And I think that the emergence of the democratization and the new technologies and the education that I've talked about as being, as driving the, this, what I think is a historic change in the place of culture is also changing and challenging authority and changing that. And the only parallel that I that, that keeps coming to me is the Reformation um, and the, the translation of um, uh, Christian scripture into um, local languages, making it available to people to read, to comment, and, and then uh, to question. Um, the precedent, unfortunately, is not good because we know that we had the wars of religion. Um, uh, but in the, because I'm a Democrat, uh, all of my all of my work is, is shaped by the idea that keeping people talking, keeping people in the same room, working together and finding solutions to their problems and to their disagreements is the only way forward we have. It's often an unsatisfactory and a difficult and a painful way forward and it often fails, but it's always better than, than the alternatives. What, when I talk about <clears throat> the diminishing power of fine art, I'm talking about that diminishing authority. It still has a lot of authority. I'm currently working on three community opera projects uh, in a, a EU funded Horizon 2020 research program, which is really interesting. It's the first time I've worked on author on opera, but if you like, acknowledging opera as the highest form of cultural authority, the highest. I think that there are things that, that are changing there, which are very positive, but there are also things that are ugly that we have to recognize, which is that um, state power, economic power, um, social power congregates around certain forms of art and culture and they support each other not always to the to the benefit of wider society so some of that authority I think is rightly coming under challenge and needs to 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 be rethought but uh, as I say the only the only thing uh, we the only effective good way of doing that is is through democrat 
democratic negotiation. Just a final thought. I mean, authority, it's, it's always seemed to me to be very significant that authority and authorship have the same root, the author. Who writes history? You know, we know the, the, the rather cynical cliche about history being written by the, the winners. Um, we, this is why culture and, and power and history and, uh, are all muddled up together. We can see it in, in the, the war that, that, that is currently happening, the question of whose story is being listened to, whose story is being heard, and what happens if you control uh, what people believe. Uh, none, of, none of this is easy, but, but it underlines how incredibly important it is that we create spaces in which those disagreements and alternative voices can be heard, but also that we don't fall into the, the for instance, the free speech absolutism of a man like Elon Musk uh, proposing to, to uh, return Donald Trump to his, his um, positions of, of, of power. I think, uh, as I wrote yesterday in a, in a blog post, it's much easier to believe in, in, to be a free speech absolutist if you were born yourself with a golden megaphone. And lots of us, uh, uh, lots of the great majority of people were not born uh, with, with any kind of platform. And that's what our work, I believe, in democratizing and making a cultural space more democratic is ultimately about uh, making the this cultural space more fair more equal and and more honest that was very good uh, great question mercedes and great 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 explanation francois in in timishwara uh, you discussed uh, the living heritage principles and and those those principles uh, are not new they have 15 15 years of of, of life almost a uh, little bit more um, are they still useful um, where do they come from and can you explain a little bit a little bit uh, what are they uh, about and, and how they are important for European capitals of culture? The Living Heritage Programme um, was first conceived in 1998 by the King Baudouin Foundation, which is a Belgian um, foundation. Uh, they wanted to work in heritage, in the the Western Balkans, um, in a in some places in a post-conflict, but in all places in a post-Soviet uh, world, and I was they commissioned me to help conceive the program, and then uh, later to uh, help deliver it and do the capacity building. I, I faced two challenges in thinking about this program. Um, well, many, but two in particular. The first was that I, I had never been to Southeast Europe and had no experience of it. Um, uh, and consequently, uh, really wasn't in a position to, to, um, to, to know, and still less to tell people there how things could be done. Um, the second was we were working in an area where there were very few resources, very little infrastructure, an area undergoing enormous social, political and economic change. Um, the, the question that I was asking myself is how do you do community art when you don't have any community artists? Um, and the answer was to work directly with communities. So 
the program actually ran from 2000 to 2005 in Bulgaria, what is now North Macedonia, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and in Romania. And during that time, we supported 140 projects, many of them, most of them, I would say, in remote and rural areas. And we supported them to, to do a very big range of, of cultural and heritage projects. So to create museums or restore museums, to work on festivals or around traditional culture, food, but also contemporary art, um, to work on natural heritage and many other things. So the living heritage principles were 10 simple statements that I drafted following research I had done on community heritage projects in Northern and Western Europe. And they were simply tools for thinking. So if we were working with people who had no experience of um, running community heritage and cultural projects, we needed to give them some guidance on how this this could be done. So to give you an example, the, 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 help, the 10 principles, the first was sustainable economic development, that there was, we were going into a situation where we were going to give somebody a grant that would be a one off grant, I knew that there would be no further grants, because there were no donors in those areas who would sustain a project long term. Uh, other principles were things like valuing volunteers, um, open and honest management. The last one uh, was dig where you stand, which I uh, it was actually the motto of a of a project called the Living Archive in um, in Milton Keynes in the UK. But I've subsequently learned that it, it was an idea uh, developed by a very interesting Swedish writer called Sven Lindqvist in the, the 1960s. And it was about recognizing that um, uh, you're, wherever you are, there is cultural heritage of real value and, and that working with your own resources was the, the most empowering thing you could do. Those principles, I think, worked really, really well. And when we did the evaluation, more than 90% of the projects that, that we supported achieved or exceeded the, the objectives they had set themselves at the beginning of the process. And indeed, I'm still in touch with with people from that area. And one of my colleagues in the Living Heritage Program, Yuri Volkovsky, I invited to, to talk to the, the, the academy camp in Timisoara. He's now um, the Deputy Minister of Culture in Bulgaria. And the ideas in the Living Heritage Program in uh, Mac Macedonia, particularly in Bosnia, and in, in Bulgaria were continued by our, our local partners um, who were absolutely essential to the program. What I, what I draw from this experience is that uh, giving people understandable, relatable concepts that are of proven worth, even if they're as simple and as self-evident as sustainable economic development is the way to help them shape and respond to their situation and their needs. Um, and this is part of why in everything I, I do, I, I place a high priority on clarity and simplicity of the concepts that we use. And unless uh, cultural professionals and others working on European capitals of culture can, can speak and offer ideas that are meaningful to people who don't work in culture, they will never be able 
to really uh, engage communities. You have to to find ideas and ways of working that make sense to the to the local inhabitants, to the residents of a neighbourhood, that um, that are meaningful for them. And just a final thought on this to underline that, just back to the idea of dig where you stand. One of the phrases that came to me and I started using during the Living Heritage Program is I was able to say to people, you are the world expert in your culture. I know nothing. I know nothing about the, the textile traditions of um, uh, Avrig in, in Romania or the Catholic uh, uh, dance traditions of um, Oresh in Bulgaria. What I know is about how to make projects work. You know about your culture. I'm just here to help you uh, make the project that makes sense to you work. And that I, we found in the Living Heritage Programme was incredibly empowering because, of course, they are, they know how, how to make their culture sing because it's what matters to them. Um, all they need from people like me is some practical tools on how to organise things or how to... Uh, you, anyway, you get my, my drift. I, I, I have a copy to the chat, the 10 principles, the link to the report uh, published in, in 2005. Um, and the reference. This is in the in the report of the of the academy camp. So if you if you want to to have a look and to explore more, uh, feel free. Um, happy happy that this is this is useful. And thank you for the great explanation again, uh, Francois. Um, I have two more questions. One is related to the Rome Charter, because you have been involved, Francois, in, in, in 2019 and 2020 in the writing of this document on the right to participate in cultural life, um, developing the concept of capabilities, um, providing with uh, a nice frame to all kind of actors involved in in cultural policy. So this this would be uh, one question. If you could explain a little bit more, uh, what is the Rome Charter? And and another uh, question would be on uh, evaluation. And this is, this is a difficult question. This is something that you also discussed in Timisoara. Uh, some of the sentences, some of your uh, statements in this talk already replied to how participatory art can be evaluated, but uh, I would like to pose this question in a more explicit way. I am concerned we don't have much time. We have around 10, 10 minutes, and then we will go to have a break. Uh, feel free to answer one question. And, uh, the other can come uh, after the, the break. OK, thank you. Um, I'll try to be, to be brief. The Rome Charter. Um, which we worked together on um, was an attempt to to answer that question that I already touched on. So we have an Article Twenty Seven of the United the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We all have the the right to participate in the cultural life of the community. But what does that mean in practice? We, I can imagine there isn't a government in the world that would say it doesn't defend that right. But what that right means in Hong Kong, 
or in Alabama or in uh, Lyon uh, is very, very different. So I wanted to, to think about what that meant and the capabilities approach of uh, Amatya Sen and Martha Nussbaum was very helpful in thinking that through. But I also uh, wanted to the charter to be something that would speak to people. Because if we're talking about people's rights, if uh, the first, the first uh, precondition, it seems to me, is that you understand what rights you have, what, what is being, um, uh, what you're entitled to. So I, I wanted the, the charter itself uh, to not be more than, than a, a single sheet of paper which we did do with some explanatory stuff behind it. But also, I, uh, I wanted it to be uh, still clearer than that. And so using the capabilities approach, I proposed that in terms of what does participation in culture mean? What does my right to participate in the cultural life of the community mean? <clears throat> I propose that it means that I have the capability to discover culture, to enjoy culture, to create culture, to share it, and to protect it. Of course, what I mean by those five things is different to what any of you might mean by those five things, but at least we have a sense that if I believe I can do those things, then it's meaningful to say that I can participate in the cultural life of my community. Um, and that idea of trying to simplify something to, to five single words, um, I thought was, was important in, in the sense of being able for cultural institutions and cities to make a commitment to, to their uh, to local people about what they were offering. They would that they can say to, to people, okay, I'm a I'm a museum, I'm a theater, I'm a, a municipality. It's my job uh, to ensure that you as a taxpayer and a resident and somebody who who uh, is in in my community, that you are able through my work, to discover, enjoy, create, share, and protect culture. Um, and <clears throat> what was very interesting in the, about that process, it, it was thanks to UCLG, which was the, the principal sponsor with the city of Rome of the project. Um, the, it was a genuinely um, global conversation that led to the refining and the development of those ideas. And, it was really exciting to me to hear people in China, um, in Colombia, in Canada, using these concepts, these five words in the conversation that we were having, because uh, I really, it, it, it demonstrated to me uh, how uh, it can be that if you give people clear ideas and meaningful ideas, they, then it transforms the conversation that you can have about what what happens so i'll 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 stop there and i can i can say a, a few words about uh, evaluation if if you think it's it's useful after the break yes yes let, let me also uh, uh, confirm that uh, we in in UCLG, we are extremely, extremely happy. We are extremely satisfied with uh, the process that led to the to the to the approval, to the adoption of the Rome Charter. Um, let me mention uh, the, the the initiator of the charter, Luca Luca Bergamo, former uh, councillor for culture of the uh, city of Rome. And uh, also let me explain that the Rome Charter is, is one of the main components of our global pact for the future that we will 
suggest we will invite local governments all over the world to 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 adopt after it has been uh, approved in hopefully in our congress in uh, daejeon in october in october this year and the rome charter has mm, has this this is a great document partly because of your involvement francois so thank you thank you very much for for being a substantial part of this of this important endeavor Mercedes remind, reminded me that I didn't give the floor to to uh, Cristina. I forgot. Sorry, Cristina. Are you ready now to take the floor briefly? Thank you. Let me let me also thank you, Sarah. Sarah is in uh, the UCLG team uh, in charge of communication, and uh, Chiara uh, is also supporting this webinar uh, from the InterArts team. We'll go now to Timisoara. We have Corina Buchea and Teodora Borgov. You both have a very tight schedule today. Uh, thank you for, for being with us. Uh, you will have the floor for the next quarter of an hour to explain uh, the relation between your work and, and what we have heard from Francois. To explain also, if you wish, briefly, the, the academic camp that uh, uh, it was held in, 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 in autumn last, last year, and to explain what you're planning for, for next year, for the European Capital of Culture year. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, Corina. Corina is the expert in cultural education and mediation of the Timisoara 2023 curatorial, curatorial, curatorial team. And Theodora, uh, Theodora Borg Borgov is the expert in community engagement and social inclusion in the same curatorial team. Thank you again, Theodora and Corina. Thank you very much as well. Um, it, is, uh, it is a great honor to, to be presenting. Uh, sometimes uh, under the pressure of, uh, of the preparation, um, it's uh, hard to remember the times when we were also uh, preparing uh, during the candidacy and how important all the uh, knowledge sharing, uh, sharing was. Um, still, we, we try our best to, to present. Um, our presentation would be um, applied. Uh, it's um, coming from the experience we have um, in this uh, process of um, becoming and holding the title as European Capital of Culture. Um, I will start very briefly um, on the topic of community development. Um, the um, the candidacy of Timisoara was very much built around uh, uh, the idea of uh, local development and community development. Um, for this reason, uh, the structure of the program um, was uh, keeping in mind uh, uh, these aspects. Um, we have structured our cultural program into we imagined a journey of the citizen. We, this was the very basic idea in mind, a journey of the citizen through something else, a transformation. It was a clear purpose of a transformative process through culture. And then uh, to, to make this more um, um, accessible, we imagined three territories people where we explore the part that uh, is related to identity and memory and um, um, personal, uh, personal image, then places. All our programs in the places territory um, have uh, a very clear function of um, activating public spaces, um, coming, uh, uh, discussing the um, 
relation between the city and its uh, uh, citizens and coming quite deeply to topics as um, right to the city and uh, who has the power to, to decide um, about the city and uh, things like this. And then the third territory was is called connections, and this is about um, the uh, the way we transcend our individual identity and local identity um, to strive to connect to global issues um, to to upgrade this understanding. It's not about um, only about our personal lives and aspirations. It's also this uh, collective identity in a global context. That was our beautiful cultural program. Now, um, in terms of implementation, um, the, the issues where um, you know, the, the reality comes um, and the challenges that we we went through were multiple uh, we, we will not uh, complain each and every uh, european capital of city, uh, culture has um, um, has this uh, journey of uh, coming from the uh, enthusiasm and the energy of uh, holding the title to the actual uh, implementation um, but uh, in this implementation, uh, where we where we focus, um, or the, the critical points that we have identified um, are in uh, several directions. Um, one, um, and here uh, Corina will um, will explain uh, uh, very well, is the actual capacity of the cultural operators to, to transmit these messages, these uh, ideals that we have put in our um, candidacy. And this is done through the program that is at the center of our cultural program and is called the power station. Um, Together with, uh, with the cultural operators, we are then um, going through the uh, adding to the culture as usual, um, additional elements or strengthening uh, the elements that are related to um, mediation and uh, education and citizen outreach, um, which is, um, which is uh, uh, a process that uh, it's, uh, it has its own challenges in terms of managing expectations, especially from the uh, political side. Uh, one year before the holding of the title, we are still explaining that the European capital of culture is not about mass events and uh, 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 big numbers and uh, uh, highlights, but it's this, um, slower transformation and uh, going into, into uh, deeper issues. Uh, nevertheless, we, we keep transmitting uh, this message at uh, all levels. And, um, and then we, we also, uh, uh, and this is truly critical uh, in these uh, times of, uh, of pressure, uh, we keep the citizen in mind. Um, of course, the, the rush of the preparation is always uh, uh, tempting to, to focus like what will the international press will say about how do we collaborate with this and that, how we, well, in, in these times of storming, uh, uh, at least, uh, at least uh, my role is to constantly remind that this is, um, this is a, a capital of culture uh, that had by design uh, the idea of the citizen in mind. And no matter how in a hurry and how much under pressure we are, 
um, we we have to to keep the effort of imagining what will be the actual experience and transformation for the people who live in the condominiums or at the outskirts of the city or the, the marginalized groups um, and so on. One thing is that we, we try to stay uh, relevant for the times we, we live in. Um, our city is now uh, uh, is hosting uh, refugees from the Ukraine and um, it has this uh, this uh, emotional turmoil uh, related to the war that is on the on the very border of uh, Romania. Um, and the immediate response was to look in our cultural program at the uh, uh, appropriate way to address this in a sensitive way. Um, we have, for example, a program that is called Moving Fireplaces, which is uh, already in 2016 was designed to address the um, migration and uh, topics like uh, Fortress Europe and uh, displacement and so on. And now uh, we include the stories, the researchers that are preparing the program for 2023 and 2022, um, they are already um, um, uh, gently approaching the um, uh, new Ukrainian community in the city and inviting them to share the stories to be um, um, transformed also with, uh, uh, with the support of, uh, of the local and uh, Ukrainian uh, artists. This was a, a very concrete example how we try to stay relevant of the very news of today. Thank you. Welcome to Corina. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm an outsider to Timisoara. I joined the curatorial team uh, this winter, actually. Um, and of course, from our position in general as a curatorial team and mine um, in specific uh, terms, because I'm looking also at the ecosystem um, and I'm looking at um, the way in which this ecosystem, um, the, 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 the journey that it passed through already and also what it still has to, um, to go through in the future. Um, so when looking at this ecosystem, uh, we are also looking at the metaphors as at the narrative, let's say, that uh, an ECOG program usually builds upon, and that specifically, specifically Timisoara built upon. And of course, as always, the concept of a uh, European capital of culture uh, starts with kind of digging into the community's identity, um, uh, specific traits, and exposing, kind of bringing to the surface the most defining traits, those that can really give um, eventually a sense of belonging uh, to the local community to which uh, this program is mainly addressed to, but also kind of sending a message and communicate something to the larger European community, um, whatever that means for each of us, let's say. So our main question when working, when working with this program is also how do you get back to that? How do you get back to the source of a program that builds and builds and grows and grows? Um, and of course, it provides or creates a, 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 a risky context to forget the source. Um, so what is the source of this good story that the European capital of culture tries to, to make, but also um, how do you make it uh, visible and pa pa really palpable at the level of each citizens uh, you can possibly reach. And one thing that um, I think one, one thing that the, this whole, the whole program of European capital of culture team of Timisoara builds upon is as um, uh, Theodora mentioned, this metaphor around this metaphor of a journey. So putting this uh, um, uh, this journey in motion in a in the same way that uh, the whole history of the city or reflecting on how the, the whole history of the city has, has gone through its own journey. Um, so I really like, and I think it's it's uh, um, it's in these times of you know migration and a lot of mobility, or um, even more in the time of where when when we are looking at mobility in different ways um, after the pandemic. Um, I think this this um, uh, this metaphor of a journey is something is something that we can all relate to, not not one or not a metaphor, not a journey itself without challenges, um, but it's definitely one in which what we know for sure is that we need, uh, we need uh, to accompany the traveler. So this is, I think, the, I believe the role of um, 
of us, um, of all of us uh, who have different roles, uh, but who have this supporting role in this ecosystem, um, where of course the community is the final beneficiary, let's say, but where you also need the support structures in order to, um, to empower and to really, you know, bring some light from the community above. Um, another 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 powerful met metaphor that I think Timishara builds on, and where uh, it really looked at uh, at the sources of its identity is this metaphor of light, um, as the city chose to also use uh, the slogan "Shine Shine Your Light, Light Up Your City." What I think it's also relevant is that in all these messages and in uh, everything that we are building, there's a you. Um, and um, this you and how do we address this you um, is also one of the one of our main um, let's say one of our main missions one of the and our when I say our is really the cultural ecosystem and all of the support structures that can that can empower and that can really create a basis for the cultural ecosystem um, so what is maybe, um, and this will be just probably my um, last, let's say, reflection on a more general level, um, is that what is maybe more relevant on a broader con context is that we are talking in the program and we are talking a lot um, also in our you know, daily conversations with, uh, with people who are really doing the grassroots work in Timisoara about um, how programs like this need to build a certain um, confidence and a certain feeling of trust. Um, and while I really, what I really see in Timisoara is this um, uh, feeling of trust from which comes from the community to the cultural sector because the cultural sector comes a lot from within the community. So there's this relationship and there's this feeling that things come from uh, from the you know from the grassroots level and things can become big um, when you are really building on something on, on something um, from from within let's say um, what I would say and this made me also reflect a bit more spontaneously let's say um, uh, starting from what Francois mentioned um, in his talk before, this tension, um, um, which starts from the from the same root, and, but this inevitably inevitable tension between author and authority, right? Um, and um, I really believe that um, somehow the the, the eco program and what we are doing here. Um, has an important mission to um, protect the author and not just protect the author from the authority, but also uh, feed into um, and really provide a space for courage to be, um, to be fueled, to be enriched, to be, um, to be fed, let's say, uh, not just uh, between the community who are coming towards culture uh, and not just with this purpose um, that we are all, of course, uh, taking upon us um, of, um, of, of, of building this sense of uh, uh, confidence, this sense of trust and this sense of, this sense of, uh, of courage that in a city of like Timisoara, you can really find in the, in the whole identity that the community feels or that the, the, that the city builds on, but also transfer and also pay attention um, to the same, to the importance of the same courage inside culture. Um, I really believe that we are now living times where um, we, 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 we need to grow this from within more than, more than ever before. And if, um, again, the relationship between the, the community and the cultural sector is something that has been growing and has been, um, uh, we've been able to, to make it happen and the, 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 the cultural ecosystem has been able to, to fuel this in long processes, again, not without challenges. Um, I think we'd still need this support and to, um, to enrich um, and to, um, how to say this, to um, exercise this, this courage in the cultural sector. 
Um, I believe this is um, more than ever um, in these times of uh, where we are, we are experiencing like a lot of gaps and a lot of uh, uh, tensions, uh, ideological, political, economical of so, some sorts. Um, we still have this mission of uh, protecting um, the author in the ecosystem. And um, yeah, um, this is something that we are trying to work on. Thank you very much, Corina. Um, I, I recognize uh, many of the developments, many of the, of the uh, explanations that Francois uh, gave to us in the first part of this, of this session. We stay in uh, Timisoara and we invite Dariana, Dariana Pau, to take the floor to explain what the Timisoara Architecture Biennale is and, and your role in the Beta team. It's really nice to meet you all and uh, it's really, really nice to see again Ed, Vita and uh, Francois. Um, yeah, so um, I'm the coordinator of uh, Look at the City project, a project that's uh, implemented and uh, curated by Beta team, the Biennial of Architecture here in Timisoara. Uh, we are a team of uh, young architects that uh, implement this, uh, this biennial. Uh, we are uh, part of or working uh, from the Order of Architects here in uh, Timish County. And uh, yeah, as um, uh, Theodora and uh, Corina said, uh, the, this uh, uh, program uh, in Timisoara, the capital of culture, is uh, um, spread through some chapters. Look at the city project is uh, set in the places uh, chapter of uh, the bit book in living spaces. And uh, we are doing uh, this project from 2015. It started before the capital of culture. It started as a campaign. And I will share a, a very brief uh, presentation. We implement this project. It's called Look at the City or Privesh Dorash in Romanian. Uh, it started as a civic campaign. We tried to, in a way, uh, let's say, we, we tried to um, raise some awareness about the public spaces in Timisoara. It started as a, a photographic uh, uh, campaign. And uh, it soon uh, <laughs> uh, developed in, um, campaign where people uh, realize the issues in the city, the issues of the public space. Afterwards, we tried to um, see what are the, um, the stories of the public space for each of uh, Timisoara uh, citizens. And some uh, artists uh, draw the, this these beautiful illustrations of these uh, stories that people send to us. And uh, yeah, the project evolved in, in this way, trying to connect with the citizens and also um, inviting the, uh, the local artists to um, transport these stories into a more visual way. So I think this, is, this project is very, um, well aligned with the theme of our session today, the community development through creative actions. We try to uh, really uh, get people, get the citizens involved in, uh, in this project through, uh, through local artists. And we uh, actually uh, got in a phase during the pandemic when we didn't know or we raised the question, what is public space for you now? when you cannot uh, access it. So we had a um, um, photographic um, uh, campaign again, but uh, it was also um, a contest and people really uh, got involved with it. But uh, in 2016, this, this project became a part of the bid book. And uh, yeah, it took uh, the the capital of culture program here in Timisoara took this project to the, the to another level. So um, we chose six spaces in the in the city. 
we in, uh, in these spaces, uh, we tried to, and we are still trying because we are uh, at the third intervention, we tried to make an, an architectural temporal installation uh, through uh, which people can experience the space, the public space that is unused or neglected or uh, unrecognized for its potential. Uh, its potential. Uh, first of all, was the project we did at the um, train station, which uh, was very uh, well embraced by the uh, community. You can see here a picture of uh, some local uh, uh, group of dancers who came to, to see the installation and uh, did a, a really nice ad hoc, let's say, uh, dance there. Um, in 2020, during the biennial, because uh, we are doing it now in 2022, it was in 2020 and so on uh, in, uh, in the past, we uh, made an intervention in a public space in a historical neighborhood. We did this, um, we did this stage where uh, the theaters in the area uh, made the, uh, the their uh, um, their shows uh, because you were not allowed to do it uh, in uh, inside. So we took the theaters and uh, get them to to do these shows outside for all the citizens. So we adapted this project in the in the situation that was uh, happening. And uh, last year, we intervened in two, more, two of these spaces. It was uh, uh, a, a public uh, space near um, a market. And the other one was uh, a public space, an unused huge plot um, in the middle of a neighborhood, a communist neighborhood, which was unused. And uh, we gave it another, another uh, function so the community can uh, gather there. This last project was also actually also, also the most uh, interesting one for us because we really get to work with the community. Uh, some of uh, the people living there coagulated in a group. They also um, made a proposal for this space uh, to the city uh, council. And we hope to help them more to develop this uh, huge empty space into a park and a, a space that, that they can use to, to meet and uh, uh, function as a community, not, to, not only as citizens of the city. Um, yeah, this is our project that we do for um, ECOC here in Timisoara. We hope to develop it uh more in the following years so we have two three more installations to come in the public space in timishwara and uh, after that we want to make a publication with our uh, highs and lows <laughs> during this project because uh, it was definitely and it is a very um, challenging project because we came to this with this installation in the middle of very neglected, unused, and uh, challenging spaces that people did not understand. But with uh, cultural events that are accessible to them, like fairs or um, lunches together or discussions, they appropriate that those spaces uh, after our installations. Um, yeah. What I want to also uh, say is that after uh, the academy camp that was here in Timisoara, I get some, I got some, uh, some more hope for this project because I was saying we passed through some highs and lows, mostly lows to say that because it's hard to work with communities. But I think what stick to me after that um, academy camp is that. Uh, little or ordinary project, they have a major impact. It's something that develops slowly, but it can change 
uh, people and it can change how communities interact with these spaces. That culture, it's an investment, it's not just, and it's not a very um, fast, uh, a very fast, a very, uh, yeah, a fast um, way of working. And that behind communities or the spaces we chose, there are people who have emotions and other core values than we have, and we have to adapt and listen to the community we work with. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I was too too short. I'm not sure, but uh, that's what that is our experience as uh, architects working in this um, this project for uh, Timisoara Capital of Culture. And it's the project we connect the most because it's something else that we are doing, except the biennial, which is very, I, I'm not saying easy because it's not, but it's more accessible to us architects. We are talking to architects. Um, we have a very good structure at the biennial and you, we use it every year, but uh, this look at the city project is more challenging than than the Banyan, I would say. Good. Let me now invite Irena, Irena Kregar Segota from Rieka. She was with us yesterday. She was the director, the chief executive officer of Rieka 2020. And she's been involved in several uh, programs of community development before she was appointed as uh, director of the capital, during the capital. Uh, now she's working with the, in the Croatian Minister, Ministry for, for Culture and Media in the Department for the Development of Arts and Culture. Irena, you can yeah. share the screen. You will, you will be allowed to, to present uh, briefly your experience. Okay, okay can, hello everybody. I'm happy to be with you again today. As George introduced, uh, prior to being CEO, I was really, uh, I was director of the department, uh, which among other things, managed uh, community projects, uh, volunteering, uh, uh, capacity building, and a large number of other things. So um, uh, I would say I have this overall experience uh, really from a bidding time to, uh, to implementation, uh, namely to evaluation of the year. I just uh, put together a few slides with the key messages about community development and uh, what we did. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that for us, it was really a transversal strategy from bidding to legacy. Like for all of you, I think it's very important to start thinking about uh, community engagement and development uh, uh, from, the, from the beginning. And it's one, maybe one of the uh, most important legacies that uh, you will leave after after your after your uh, celebratory year. Um, stronger communities, um, uh, better connected communities, communities with uh, bigger capacities are really uh, guarantees that the, the culture and the creativity will continue to develop in your city and your region. So. Um, uh, just if we want to put it into categories, we uh, designed uh, community programs, really uh, aimed uh, uh, community aimed tailored programs. So programs that uh, were uh, implemented and carried out uh, in the communities and by the communities. And then also uh, programs, uh, cultural and artistic programs where we involved community in a certain level of that activity. Another very important thing that we did from the very beginning is that we dedicated a physical space. We called it Rehab, Rijeka Hub, but also a rehabilitation uh, uh, a point that was really a hotbed for many of our programs. It was information center, it was cultural center, but it was what is very important co-working space not in the commercial uh, um, uh, meaning, but really co-working for all our partners. And 
also a meeting point for different communities who who met there, uh, designed their projects, uh, worked with us. Uh, uh, this space uh, uh, was used for different capacity building programs, uh, uh, presentation of the programs, et cetera, et cetera. And importantly, very important is that this space is, uh, is alive today, functioning, and continues to work as a community hub. Uh, hub. We, uh, in 2018 and in 2019, so two years prior to uh, 2020, we launched two campaigns that uh, were named uh, Participate, uh, really with a, an exclamation mark, a very general campaigns where we uh, asked people to join us, but we also designed specific platforms. Because if your campaign uh, remained general, uh, it's it's illusionary that you will involve everybody. So really, you need to do some kind of uh, segmentation. You need to work uh, uh, with a very uh, or rather strong focus. And I would say it's very useful if you have concrete tools or platforms to involve your uh, communities. The slogan for us was for our community programs was active citizens in an active city. Uh, these activities uh, were created to involve citizens in uh, uh, cultural and uh, social events, but also uh, to create capacity building for them, uh, especially for informal uh, civil societies, groups and individuals, uh, so that they can be able to carry on, uh, uh, not just during 2020, but uh, afterwards um, uh, the, uh, with their own programs. These three platforms were uh, green wave uh, that was designed for the projects linked with ecology, climate change, everything that is green in the city from, from small urban gardens to, uh, I don't know, putting uh, uh, plants on top of uh, uh, high rising buildings, uh, so very different kind or dealing with water, which is a very hot topic in Rijeka. So all kind of uh, green, uh, green topics and green projects. Uh, civil initiatives was more general and it was aimed at uh, uh, cultural uh, projects, but also with a very strong social component. So projects that uh, always had to answer this question, uh, what is, which kind of problem are we solving in our uh, community and what is the added value of, of our project? Uh, something very innovative, at least for us and for Rijeka and the region was citizen council um the the people in the citizen council were, were drawn it was some kind of almost of lottery uh they were they were uh drawn they participated and they really had the power uh to choose the project and to uh to have uh, um, a decisive vote so in in terms of uh, when when it came to financing so the 2020 as an agency we really try to function there as a capacity building provider and a, a coordinator. Uh, I will give you now examples, some uh, illustrative examples of the projects that, did with, that we did. Uh, one of the most successful ones and really large in scope that was developed for several years and has numerous activities was called 27 Neighborhoods. I mentioned that yesterday when we talked about uh, international cooperation because it had a very strong European component. Uh, we chose, um, uh, we, we, we had a call for 27 uh, neighborhoods or 27 communities. A neighborhood could be a part of a city or a small island or a mountain village uh, in our region, which is very, very diverse. Um, usually uh, the, the neighborhoods that were chosen were really uh, demonstrating the strong need to, to, for projects uh, uh, that, would, uh, that would gather people together, uh, that would solve some problems. We had a neighborhood that had only like 10 inhabitants uh, and really had to, to deal with that. So, and these neighborhoods were connected with 27 neighborhoods in, uh, in each uh, EU country. They developed their projects. And as I said, we helped with financing, coordinating, uh, communication, um, uh, also, link them with artists, with professional artists uh, to help to have, uh, uh, to, to guarantee a, a high quality, high profile of the project, but they had a very, very 
uh, strong voice and uh, independent uh, agency in that. Um, apart from activities that they did, each neighborhood also had what we call the living room. So a dedicated, uh, specific uh, dedicated uh, physical space where uh, people in that neighborhood, in that community could come uh, ask for information um, or not just on our program, on their program, but uh, on all kinds of questions that, that were relevant in their, in their community. Another part, uh, another program that I would like to highlight was called the uh, uh, Porto Etno Festival, and uh, it was uh, its main topic was uh, uh, national uh, diversity in Rijeka. We have more than twenty uh, so-called traditional uh, minorities. When I say traditional, I mean that we're in Rijeka for the last uh, hundred or more years, but we also have a lot of newcomers uh, as, as the world is changing around, around us. So we, we tried to gather this, this group, these communities through food and uh, music. Uh, we had the professional artistic layer of this program, but also uh, a layer that was completely designed by by different uh, national groups that uh, that participated, and it was it was as you can imagine very joyful. Uh, we had a you know a hundred a large Italian community that is in Rijeka, but we also had like a two Thai cooks uh, uh, who who just moved to Rijeka uh, several years uh, ago. Another interesting project, it's called uh, Lungo Mare Art. And this was a project that uh, uh, brought uh, contemporary art sculptures to different uh, places on our coast and on islands. And uh, uh, through this project, we created the new cultural and touristic roof. What is uh, important for our topic is that we involve local communities in this. So the artists, uh, prior to proposing uh, contemporary art sculpture, artists stayed in the community uh, for several months, uh, uh, worked with the community so that their works were really, really inspired by, uh, by, by the needs, uh, by, by all kinds of different needs uh, in the community. Also the capacity building program uh, that I mentioned uh, already, which was not just for, for professionals, for cultural workers, but also really for uh, representatives of informal uh, uh, groups, uh, civil society groups or individuals who were given all kinds of knowledge from uh, fundraising to writing EU projects to uh, communication to managing projects and this is a really strong legacy the knowledge that uh, this pro this program left be behind uh, more than 3,000 people passed through their program and I would say that uh, at least one third were representatives of uh, informal civil, civil society group. Uh, volunteering program, of course, uh, you all have uh, your own, uh, I imagine, volunteering program. It's a wonderful way uh, to, to link with the community, to join the community, uh, and to communicate about everything that you do through these uh, dedicated, dedicated uh, individuals. And the final, uh, uh, final example I would like to, to give you is uh, our link that we tried to connect with the business sector. So we, uh, uh, we inspired, incited uh, uh, the creation of an association that was called the Partneri, like partners, uh, which gathered uh, from individual to, from individual businessmen to a smaller or larger company in Rijeka and in, um, uh, in our region. The, 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 the aim of this association was not uh, purely philanthropic. So yes, they financed projects, but what is also very important is that we had regular meetings and talks between the cultural and artistic groups and uh, their group, uh, because we, we identified that there is a 
um, a lot of miscommunication going on, not, uh, a lack of understanding. And uh, I think this really, these dialogues really help uh, this, this business community uh, have better insight into what we were trying to do. And uh, what is important as a legacy, they continue uh, uh, with their own calls uh, for financing uh, cultural and uh, uh, creative projects. And this is really a unique, uh, unique initiative uh, in, uh, in uh, Croatia. Uh, so I was I was asked to be uh, rather shorter, succinct, but uh, I would uh, I'd be happy to answer answer your your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Irena Bala. That was very complete, very interesting projects. I would like to know more about uh, all of them. And now we move to Kaunas. Ed, I'm really happy to see you and to invite you and and Vita to take the floor to explain the context of your work in, in, in Sanjay, uh, a neighborhood in Kaunas. Uh, you lead the community association of that, that neighborhood. And let me also, in order to introduce you that, uh, let me add that uh, your program uh, deserved a special mention of the jury in our award, the International Award Culture 21, uh, UCLG Mexico City and this was if I remember well in 2016 so congratulations for this international recognition and now the floor is yours to explain uh, where you are and what what you do thank you thank you Jordi and very nice to be with everyone here it's nice to see some friends that we know and then to hear things from people we don't know uh, we're both uh, artists, Ed and Vita, uh, community artists, and we work in the place where we live. And indeed, you, you, it's interesting, you mentioned 2016, because in, in, in many ways, that peer recognition was something that was very important for her work on the cabbage field, which was this public space that had gone into disrepair, a grey space, some people call it. It was unclear what its future would be. And... Uh, in, 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 in some ways, that recognition in 2016 it was something that was very important to us at that time. And uh, I, I think that's the first reflection I want to make on our, on our work. Uh, we've, we've been working maybe a decade of work here in, in, in our community. And it's, it seems to me that one has to think in time frames of decades rather than projects to understand this work in, in community. It seems to me that there's a, there's, um, a problematic that we face in, in terms of, let's say, the frameworks of the European capital of culture, which is that very often the uh, aperture by which the European capital of culture tries to work is from the framework of a project to be managed. And that from this type of project management aperture, then you get into this process of having a name, having a mission, having an objective, having a target, having a result, having a legacy. And these things always have to be produced within periods of maybe 12 months or 24 months, 36 months and so on and so on. And for us, uh, I, I think the uh, a problematic is that we can't appear on that radar, a project management aperture, because generally, our work will only appear every five or six years and then disappear. And then will reappear five or six years later. So for instance, in 2016, we appear on the aperture that was really important to us. Let's say that it was recognized that the work on the cabbage field and this reclamation of public space was something that was important. But then that disappears and the work continues on without any appearance on anybody's radar. And then in 2022, it reappears and it jumps on a radar of Esche, Capital of Culture, where we will perform our community opera that's been in production for six years. And that will happen in early June on the, on the 9th and 10th of June. And then on the 11th of June, we move over into the, Bau, the new Bauhaus Awards because our work in terms of a digital mapping process has also been recognized or shortlisted for a prize in New Bauhaus. Right, right. So, so this, this is like, a, you know, again, 
in 2022, this work appears. And then in 2023, and probably for five or six more years, it'll disappear off the radar. And so it, it seems to me we're, we're not a unique phenomenon in terms of cultural practitioners who don't appear on the radar. Like we're, we, we will never appear on the radar of the Lithuanian Culture Board in terms of cultural funding. I will never appear on the radar of Creative Ireland for cultural funding. Uh, I will never appear on the European Capital of Culture in CONUS for funding because it, it, it has to appear within the rate, within this aperture of the framework. Uh, framework of project management. And it seems to me. And the community work uh, or the community artwork that we are uh, practicing here, uh, it's very hard to frame into this. Uh, project terms and uh, project time frame. Uh, so really for someone who engages locally very deeply into cultural um, field and, uh, and it's a continuous work, uh, this format of, uh, of short inputs of uh, uh, even, even three years is a short input of a cultural capital. Uh, it doesn't fit really properly the community needs, because we do not operate on the project terms. We operate on our inner clock, inner, uh, inner framework. And uh, so it's really, uh, we never fit a uh, CONUS capital of city because uh, we are not the project-based community. And, and that is a problem, I think, of the cultural capitals uh, all around Europe. Uh, it's, if, if it's not uh, one project that shows the success, but it's something that is risky, that takes uh, long time periods, that uh, the outcomes are never clear, then uh, cultural capitals have problems with such communities because cultural capitals are targeted for successful projects and community is never <laughs> a guarantee for success because it's an open source, it's an open um, uh, frame, it's actually it's frame at all. And it's very hard to, to, to count the quantity of, uh, of our success, hard to count the quantity even of the community members. So uh, it just, it's not fitting into the existing institutional frames. And uh, so uh, we have to say that even though CONAS uh, is a capital of culture uh, this year, we are not in that program. Uh, and we get recognitions from outside the world, uh, the country, but we are not really seen uh, in our own city as a wor partner worth to uh, to showcase the cultural goals. What you are saying, Vita, fits perfectly with the pending uh, question that uh, I raised to Francois. But Ed, you were about to to to, to complement, so please carry on and. Later, I'll give, once you've finished, Francois, Francois will take the floor to, to, to reply to that question and to comment. And then I, I, I suppose the second sort of, uh, you know, general comment that I'd like to make is the idea that the community is an object and not the subject of cultural work. And for me, an awful lot of engagement with community asks the question, how do we address community? And I, I would like to flip that question around and I would like to ask, how does community address you? You, the cultural practitioner, you, the cultural institution, you, the culture board of your country. How does a community address you? And in general, I would say that there are very few openings. There are very few interfaces for community to address backwards. It's always a, it's never a problem if a cultural organization comes to a community and says, we have a program that we want to do. We have a group of 20 or 30 residents, artist residents that we want to put into your community. And at the end of those 20 or 30 residents, we'll produce 20 or 30 exhibitions. And those 20 or 30 exhibitions will, you know, further the career of the individual artists or practitioners who are involved in it. But where is the community used as a subject in and of its own right. And it seems to me this is where there is a, you know, a radical departure being proffered by something like uh, the Rome Charter, because I think it really creates a framework 
in which it's the question has been asked, when is the community creating? How is the community creating? What supports are there for the community to create? Um, and the second thing I think that goes with this sense of culture uh, and community as an object of culture rather than a subject of culture is, is the idea that in some ways the, the, the community is in always something to be colonized, always something that has to find, culture has to go out towards it. Culture has to move into this periphery. And there's a huge underestimation, it seems to me, that culture is community, that there is a culture already existing, already alive, already thriving, already percolating within the cultural, within the cultural process that's already existing. Why? Because two or three or four or 500 people have decided to live in an area. They've decided to settle themselves into a particular landscape, into a particular natural ecology. And this already is the, is the raw material that creates a culture. The historical landscape, the natural landscape, the cultural heritage and the living lives of people where they are. And that's, it seems to me, where the living heritage was quite radical, is that it was acknowledging that culture is not something that needs to be brought into community, but it was something that is already there and is already existing and is already thriving. So these are the two points I think we, we, we want to frame it. We, we, we are not, I, I hope we don't uh, communicate the idea of a victim. We don't feel like victims. No. Uh, we, we don't, um, it, it's just that we're, we don't appear on this radar. And I don't know that we want to appear on the radar of the, the cultural infrastructure and the cultural sort of uh, machine that is currently in, in, in operation that puts such a big emphasis. I said it in my last presentation, the big emphasis on project management. And with that, every three euros that's spent, three euros get spent on community. So we're here, you know, advocating for the European capital of culture are the advisors who advise the European capital of culture or the people who are employed by the European capital of culture. Two euros is then spent on administration and management and staffing of the European capital of culture and one euro spent on the artistic process itself. I would really love to see a complete shift in that from three euros to be spent on the artistic process and the mediation of that, two euros to be spent on the staffing and the type of mediation to make an engagement of communities show itself, and one euro please to be spent on communities. Thank you very much. I'm happy to, to, to see how concrete you go in the recommendations. And, 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 and let, me, let me make a parallel to, to, to my city, to Barcelona. Because that some, well, I, I've advocated for similar measures quantitatively to take place in the main cultural organizations of Barcelona, uh, similar to what you are saying. Uh, Francois, pending question on the evaluation of participatory art, the frames that allow. Uh, that evaluation uh, if you can make it brief because we would like to open the floor to everybody and then uh, and including including Christina who has arrived to her office safe we are happy that you are safe at the office uh, Francois you have the floor thank you Jordi um, let me connect it to something that Ed has just said. <clears throat> he used a hard word talking about um, the cultural sector thinking that it has to colonize communities. Um, but I, and it is a hard word to talk in that in that way, but it's also true. One of the paradoxes of the um, community work is that it often comes with an expectation, not only from within the cultural sector, but from uh, those who finance it and from politicians, 
that there should be some social outcome from the cultural work that you do with communities, as opposed to my position, which is that it's a human right. We don't make the same expectation of, of audiences who go to the theater or to the opera or to galleries. Um, and I think asking questions about why we make such different assumptions about community work and about other cultural work raises some uncomfortable questions about how we see our fellow citizens. Um, be that as it may, the expectation that community work should be evaluated comes because of this expectation that it has a social purpose. I think that I, I would, was one of the people that, that first began to work on evaluation of, of social projects um, 25 and 30 years ago. And I think that a lot of that early work has been misunderstood uh, and we now have a situation where the evaluation of community projects can often be quite problematic. It's, it's more, in reality, it's more about trying to justify the relatively small amounts of money that are spent on, cultural pro on social cultural projects or community cultural projects. Um, I think evaluation is really important. You can't be creative without evaluating. You, as, soon, as soon as an artist makes a mark or plays a note or makes a gesture, they are unconsciously and sometimes consciously comparing their performance with their intention, which is all that evaluation is trying to do. So I don't think there's anything inherently wrong or difficult even about evaluating projects. The question is, why are you doing it? If you're doing it to improve your performance, to learn from your experience, to make the next project richer, better, more successful, then I think you're doing it for the right reasons. If you're doing it simply because a funder is requiring you to answer certain questions set by the funder, then I think you're much more in this uncomfortable logic of saying that somehow uh, poor people have to justify their access to cultural funds by being better poor people, whereas middle class people are allowed simply to have uh, their cultural funding without any strings attached. When we spoke in, in Timisoara, I, I gave a, a little presentation about um, ways of evaluating and some of the mistakes to uh, that can people fall into and the ways of avoiding them. And I won't repeat all that here. You'll find it, it both in the materials from the Timisoara Academy camp and uh, in the report. But I think the, the real thing that I would say, the important thing I would say is, if you're required to evaluate, ask yourself what the purpose of that evaluation is and how can it benefit your work and the, and the, the people who are, in the end, the taxpayers for all the work that we do. How is it going to help them? That was very good, Francois. Um, good question to end, but and also brilliant explanation of the contexts of uh, evaluation. Christina, you had a question. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yes, the question, well, actually, it was more a sort of thought that I had when, when I was hearing the brilliant speech of Francois this morning. And I was sort of reconnecting it to what Sylvia was saying yesterday about the balance between the local level and the international level within an ECOPS program. So my, my question, my thought to be discussed with Francois is exactly about this issue of balancing community level and local level, let's say, and international level. How do you think this is possible when we talk about 
participatory art or community art. I heard your, your uh, very clever and clear distinction between the two, but let's talk about both concepts together. How do you think they could be framed both at local and international level within the programme of an ECOC? When you say how could they be framed, um, can you explain a bit more what you mean? Well, I think the assumption when we talk about participatory art and community art is that it is something that can happen only uh, in engaging local communities. So how do we, cons well, let's say balance this with the international part of an ECOC program? Maybe it's clearer like that. It seems to me that, that implicit in your question, but I don't mean that you think this, but that there is implicitly the idea that the cultural, that, that local community culture is, is inevitably lacking ambition um, of limited interest to anyone except in that immediate neighborhood. Um, <coughs> and that there are, there are still a lot of prejudices and assumptions about what community work can be. But as I said, you know, the, everyone, uh, Ed, I hope will forgive me for this cliche about Irish culture, but everyone who visits Ireland loves the idea of, of stopping and going into a pub and finding people playing music there and being invited to sit down and, and enjoy that. In a, in a sense, there is something profoundly valuable for all of us to be invited into someone else's real culture, as opposed to the, the culture that they put on for the world. Um, and so I think we should not have that hesitation. Of course, we need to understand that there are things that are designed really for a local audience where you have to to be local to even understand what's happening because the, the references and so on are so much embedded in that community but there's lots of other things that that can be um uh, uh that that can be shared and i often when i talk about participatory art and and the way that it's changed i often use a picture of the London 2012 Olympic Games opening ceremony because I it was quite in some ways it, it was quite a shocking moment for me because essentially when London had the the eyes of the world upon it for an evening what did it decide to do it put on a community play about things like the National Health Service that nobody outside England uh, well outside the UK understands or cares about it was extraordinary and yet it was a, a beautiful moment and it involved 3,000 non-professional uh, artists uh, as well as Paul McCartney and all the famous people so I think those two extremes from um, you know this the authenticity of being invited to join in uh, um, somebody's own culture to finding ways of saying, yes, we can put participatory art on this world stage if we just have the resources to do it and the ambition and the ideas and the, and the artists who can make that happen. I think all of those things are possible. The biggest barrier is often our own assumptions about what can and should be done. That was nice. Um, I, I also like what you say, uh, Francois is very much connected to what Ed said on the, on the cycles or on the, the timing of the work that mm. uh, communities do at the local level. And they stay, they stay in the place and they, 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 they know what happened in the past and they, they want to stay in the future and create meaning together for the future. And this is not always uh, matching uh, 
the timing set by institutions. Francois. Just a, a quick comment. One of the other assumptions that we sometimes make is that uh, communities only want to do things about themselves. Um, communities can want an exciting moment that is all from outside that that opens new possibilities just as much as anything else there there is a there is room for everything there's room for spectacle there's room for excitement there's room for very intimate and local the key thing is only to 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 be working with people and listening to them and and finding where their heart is and what they they want to be doing now as I was listening uh, to all of you, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for a, a really wonderful conversation. Uh, this is another session of this academy camp that wants to pull together uh, what has been done concretely on themes that were uh, identified as relevant by the European capitals of culture in terms of their needs for capacity building. And they have been four independent different academy camps, but I already had the feeling yesterday afternoon, but the conversation with Francois and all of you today has, has confirmed it. Yes, it is about different themes, but they are all somehow connected. There is a thread. And I think that as we move on uh, through these four sessions, we're seeing this. And uh, I think that this is what we had in mind, Jordi, when, when we talked about, you know, this academy camp with you. I'm really very, very pleased that it is actually happening. So see you later. Thank you so, so much, Francois, and all the rest of you that have so generously shared your time with us today. Mm -hmm.